One of the things that I like so much about studying Chinese and Chinese history is that it provides the most opposite example of what we ourselves in the West can compare to. There is, in my opinion, no more different of a culture to the West than China. And the goal of this video is actually to reflect on our own roots as a society rather than using this as a chance to denigrate Chinese culture and tradition. There's many cultural aspects of Western tradition that we take for granted because we've never been presented with an opposite extreme that we personally understand. So certain ideas about our society can be seen as standard or trivial. For instance, it's assumed that the orientation towards freedom and self-determination are fundamental to human nature. So naturally, we extrapolate these values onto other societies. Is that fair though? What could be considered so fundamental that it links our civilization to most different other civilizations on the planet? Well, it's certainly not egalitarianism. The most egalitarian people on the planet would be hunter-gatherer people living in the more primitive corners of the world, followed by people who live in more rural populations. On the other end of the spectrum are densely populated urban environments, with the more densely populated places being the least egalitarian. China fits into that latter branch and has developed its culture to suit its highly populated urban environment. Even during the Warring States period of 500 BC, China boasted a population of around 40 million people owing to its fertile soil and large rivers. I want to make this the primary theme of the video, and that's that Chinese culture is ultimately shaped by its adaption to its geography. Let's look at that. Zhongguo, the Middle Kingdom. It's not the only time a kingdom has thought itself as the center of the world. One might say it's a mix of arrogance or ignorance. In China's case though, it would have been impossible not to think of yourself at the center of the world had you lived there at the time. To the north is the Siberian tundra, separated by empty rolling grasslands and a desert. To the west is the Gobi Desert, and to the southwest you have the Tibetan Plateau followed by the Himalayas. To the south is densely packed rainforest, and to the east is the Pacific Ocean. You're already flanked by two record-holding barriers, the world's biggest mountain range and the world's biggest ocean. Being hemmed in on all sides, it wasn't that China was separated from the rest of the world, it's that China was the world, at least if you were Chinese. And the world wasn't talked about as a geographic plane of existence with north, south, east, and west, but rather as Tianxia, which means everything under heaven. So China, known as the Middle Kingdom, doesn't exist on the eastern landmass of Asia on the northern hemisphere. No, China, aka everything that ever was and ever will be, exists in the dimensional plane below heaven and above the underworld. Now, there were other peoples that existed in this plane that didn't live in the Chinese realm, but they were considered for the most part irrelevant and savage. These sparsely populated frontier people eked out an existence on the edge of the world, living in obscurity, according to the ancient Chinese thought. And even if they aren't directly under the dominion of Chinese rule, they were still technically the subjects of the Chinese ruler because these people were simply seen as the descendants of Chinese people. Even when knowledge of Rome came to light during around the Three Kingdoms era, circa 2000 years ago, it was theorized that this other great civilization to the west was in fact nothing more than a mirror image of the Chinese Han civilization, because in Taoist thought, if you venture beyond the realm of the end of the world, you end up in some kind of parallel universe of some sort, where everything on the other side was reflected. Rome was referred to as Da Qin, if you're interested in looking that up. Now I want to move on to the next point, and that's differentiating the societal differences between a land power and a sea power. In the West, we can trace our roots back to seafaring peoples who roamed the Mediterranean Sea. 
When someone has access to the sea and can travel across the water, they have the ability to pack up their things, take their whole lives with them, and head to greener pastures. It also allows you to make a living by trade as opposed to purely agricultural work. So if the surroundings you're in became hostile to peaceful life, you could move. On the other hand, if you're a landlocked individual and things got hairy, you can't just pick up and leave so easily. Think about all the extra fodder you would have to pack just for your animals, which would make the journey even more laborious. Think about how long the journey would take. Think about how far you could even get. Then when you arrive at your destination, how are you going to support yourself? It would take at least six months to get from sowing to harvest, whereas ocean going peoples could just cast a net and catch a fish. So as a landlocked person, the only feasible way of living is to accept your fate. And I think this resignation to one's fate echoes deeply in traditional and contemporary Chinese society. The only way to survive is to be totally dependent on whoever is in charge or become in charge yourself. There's no third option. In Chinese prehistory, the land would have been inhabited by clans who lived adjacent to each other. One clan would become dominant over another, then that clan would be dominated by another, until the area is dominated by one group of people. These clans would eventually become small kingdoms, which were followed by bigger kingdoms, and finally, in the end, they would all be dominated by one kingdom. This one kingdom would be like a historic monopoly on the landmass, and once China became a singular entity, it was impossible to permanently go back to a plurality of kingdoms. As echoed by the opening line of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, the empire, long divided, must unite. Long united, must divide. Thus it has ever been. This is cemented by the fact that the land is now primarily inhabited by one homogenous ethnic group. This kingdom, which now controls everything under heaven, has one singular directive, and that is to maintain order. And at times China isn't under the rule of one banner, it's chaos. Dynasties can last hundreds of years, but when the bow breaks and China is fractured into multiple competing factions, hell on earth erupts. Six out of the twelve bloodiest wars in history were fought in China. The Three Kingdoms period alone reduced the population of the entire world by 20% purely as a result of the carnage in China during that era. Culturally speaking, Chinese are traumatized by the results of chaos in a way that is simply unrelatable to outsiders. Whether that's chaos in living memory or in the historical collective consciousness of the masses. On the one hand, you could say, Chinese tradition emphasizes order over morality. But I wouldn't say that's the case. In Chinese culture, order is morality. The primary tenets of Confucianism is all about maintaining order and preserving the social hierarchies. To prevent rebellion is to institute the morality of being loyal to your superiors. Rebellions happen when the son turns against the father, the subject turns against the ruler, the peasant turns against the magistrate, and that's when chaos happens. It was seen as a fair system, however, because the caveat in Confucianism is that the subordinates reward their superiors with loyalty because of their morality, and if the leaders were to turn from a righteous path, then it would be the responsibility of the subordinates to do something about it. So it's not an inherently dystopian system. Confucianism is what you'd call a social theory masquerading as a religion, and the purpose of which is to preserve society as it was envisioned by Confucius at the time of Confucius. However, Confucianism pales in comparison to its philosophical counterpart, legalism. Legalism can be considered to be the yin of Confucius's yang, and you better believe it, legalism is a dark philosophy. To put a name to a picture, Think of The Art of War by Sun Tzu. This is a legalist text that almost everyone would have read. So to put it simply, legalism is a study of real politique, Machiavellianism, and statecraft. It's a philosophy about how to maintain the power of the state, and this isn't confined to one book like The Prince by Machiavelli. It's an entire school of thought that goes back 2,000 years with famed legalist scholars and rulers making a name for themselves every century, shaping Chinese history as we know it. Even in the modern day, legalist thought is embedded into the strategies of the political and business elite. Here's an example. In 2020, the water levels around the Three Gorges Dam were getting dangerously high. So dam water was released into the surrounding areas, flooding whole villages in order to protect the bigger cities where of course the important people lived. 
Despite ultimately being responsible for ruining these villagers' lives, they were instead given packets of two-minute noodles. This kind of thing is extremely common when some kind of disaster happens. And the reason for this very callous attitude is because of some of the ideas written in legalist philosophy. One of these legalist texts called the Han Feizhe, which is the apex text for understanding legalist thought, essentially states that people at their core are evil. They don't understand themselves, they are totally at the mercy of their animalistic drives, and you can't trust a human to be a truly rational actor. It's the unconscious underbelly of the human psyche that the legalist fears. According to the Han Feidze, if a disaster strikes a village and the so-called benevolent leader acquiesces to their demands and helps rebuild their village, then the people from the surrounding areas who were also affected by the flood will seethe because the other villagers got help, but they didn't. So the leader helps them as well, but then the neighboring province who weren't affected by the floods will also be upset with the leader because he didn't help them when they got raided by bandits or something. So then the leader goes and helps them as well. This goes on for some time where the leader benevolently helps every person in the land who is in need. But now as a result, the leader is now stretching himself thin to keep everybody happy. When he's unable to continue helping them, how do the peasants react? With gratitude? No, instead resentment. Now their bickering is even more than before and the leader now becomes the focus of their ire then they rebel. On the other hand, if in the very beginning the leader was seen as cold and unfeeling and harsh, no one would have expected anything from him, and the dissatisfaction would be purely localized. The simple giving of a pack of two-minute noodles would fill them with gratitude and importantly, stop the train of events that would lead to the public's dissatisfaction of the leader and the insurrection that would follow. And for the people in that village that aren't satisfied, the point that's meant to be made is, so what? It's about defining the boundaries between subject and ruler, and the ruler wants to make it clear. You're not going to tell me what to do, how I should do it, but instead, you're going to accept what I give you, and you're going to accept your fate. And getting people to resign themselves to their fate is how they keep the leadership stable and hence maintain order. For the legalists, order doesn't have to come from having a prosperous society. Instead, order is achieved through the protection of the ruling class, and to protect the ruling class, they spent thousands of years devising strategies of psychological warfare, conventional warfare, and statecraft. You have to understand the underlying fabric of Chinese governance is not and never was about the welfare of the people. It's the preservation of order, and everyone from the highest to the lowest in society is given the responsibility to maintain this order. Another thing that very much underlies the hierarchic nature of their society is the fact that it is a social norm for a good percentage of restless young men to be left with no marriage prospects owing to polygamy. China is traditionally a polygamous society and it's standard procedure to get as many wives as you can possibly support. And being involuntarily celibate for a significant minority of society wasn't due to moral purity, but with being involuntarily stacked at the bottom of society with no social mobility. Essentially, all the women and all the alpha male men, if you can use that term, conspired against the underclass, the beta males in their society, to keep them in their place. A woman's family would never think about letting their daughter marry someone who didn't have his own home and had a lower social status than hers. Naturally, however, there's fewer men above her in the social order than below her, and as a result, polygamy is the accepted compromise between the minority of men who have upwards of six wives and the women who want a better life. This kind of dysfunction is normal in many cultures, but importantly, the end result of a society that prevents a large minority of restless young men from having social mobility is violence. Economic theory focuses on how more and more resources going to fewer and fewer people leads to chaos, and that is true. But in the Darwinistic sense, our modus operandi as a species is to survive and replicate. And ultimately, more and more girls being married to fewer and fewer men leads to the same result. Emperors famously tried to wed as many women as their body would physically allow them. My favorite emperor, Hong Shou Chuan of the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom, had 88 wives. 88, just because 88 is a lucky number. But 88 is rookie numbers compared to Qin Shi Huang who had 13,000. Did you ever wonder why they used eunuchs as palace attendants? It's because the emperor wanted to ensure that the people who were serving them had no natural male urges and thus wouldn't undermine his position as the alpha male, perhaps by stealing 
stealing away one of his 13,000 wives. As I said, society had conspired to repress the lower value males. But I digress. The point I wanted to make with this is that the haves in society, aka the men with 88 wives who need to support a massive family, need to sustain this dysfunction in order to maintain their position. In order to prevent an incel rebellion from occurring, an excess amount of order is necessary to keep the plebs from violently moving up the social dominance hierarchy. The majority of Chinese who dislike centralized authority in China are people from the coastal regions, but very specifically the Cantonese and Hakka-speaking people, along with people from Guangxi and Fujian. Since China was forced open by the West in the aftermath of the Opium War, these lower provinces were suddenly exposed to a new front. Where before the sea was a boundary, now it was a gateway. Remember how we were discussing the difference between seafaring people and landlocked people? Well, suddenly these southeastern people had the ability to be seafarers, or at least glean the ethic of that lifestyle. And like we mentioned before, if this kind of person is pressured, they have the option of leaving, and leave they did. It was at this time in the 19th century that the Chinese started immigrating around the world. Moreover, the Chinese people living in the southeast were exposed to foreign ideas in a way that people in the interior weren't. Traders may have gotten a grasp of pidgin English. Parishes were being built all over the place. Chinatowns in every country provided a portal into the foreign world. It's also these regions that were heavily influenced by the foreign colonies. The picture could not be more different for the rest of China, however. And so even to this day, there is a cultural split between the Mandarin-speaking people people and the typically Cantonese speaking South who are more freedom orientated. When you go to a Chinatown or any shop in the West, majority of the time it's going to be run by a Cantonese speaking person or that person can speak Cantonese. It's only since the 1980s that immigration from the mainland resumed since the communists took power and now there are increasingly more Mandarin speaking peoples migrating. Another example is if you go to church and you see Chinese people there, or you go to a Chinese church, majority of the people there are from this region of China. So understand that the Chinese were used to mingling within the West, typically are culturally different from the Chinese that live in the interior. In China proper though, it's normal to see portraits of Mao in people's restaurants hung up like a religious icon. Of course, no one forced them to do that, but invoking the semi-divine authority of an all-powerful ruler just raises the vibe for them. And the same way a Catholic venerates a bust of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Let me ask you, what do you think Mao represents to the people who hang his facade on their wall? Well, according to Maoist ideas, he's supposed to represent perpetual revolution. So does he represent rebellion or chaos? Do you think that this is what the ordinary Chinese person gets off? No. Mao's image has gone full circle. From tearing down old structures as an act of rebellion to becoming a symbol of social unity and order. When a labor movement takes its grievance to the capital, often they are accompanied by a large picture frame of Mao so as to invoke the patriarch of the social order and receive his blessings. The truth is, if you ask any of these guys about Mao, they don't know anything. I see people hanging up pictures of Mao right next to Sai Mao. Sai Mao is the god of money. That's right, money cat. But things like this have a qualitatively religious feel to them. We worship fundamental values first and foremost, then we plaster icons onto them and worship all the lore myths that come along with them. Nebiente 為什麼? 
对来说有点可惜。The last point I want to bring up is the general attitude towards Xinjiang. China needs to clamp down on the frontier region of Xinjiang to prevent a pan-Turkic or a pan-Muslim movement from essentially opening up a second front of exposure to the Chinese heartland. Prior to the 18th century. The Pacific Ocean was an impenetrable barrier for the Chinese, keeping possible threats from the outside world out. The Qing government did everything it could to constrain the movements of foreigners in Canton, but after about a century of trade and two major wars with the Ocean People, the door to the country was blown off, and suddenly the whole coastline and even the rivers. Became a vulnerable opening into the country. Similarly, with Xinjiang, the Gobi Desert separated the mainland from Eurasia, with the name Xinjiang meaning boundary, new boundary. Just like the coastline, this border region would be met with incursions by foreign powers. One of which are the Russians, by way of supporting the independent state of East Turkestan in 1933. The trouble with this region is that this region is pulled in many different directions by different factions. The Chinese see the land as historically theirs, but at the same time, the Russian dominance in Central Asia can't be understated. Then there's religion. Xinjiang is the only province in China that can be considered religious, and this stands in stark contrast to the party's official policy of atheism and party-controlled religious activities. Lastly, and most importantly, the Uyghurs are not Chinese. In fact, they're a Turkic people. I had a close friend who was a Tatar from Russia, and we went to a Uyghur restaurant together near our university. And amazingly, there were words and phrases the Uyghur man spoke that my Tatar friend could understand. I remember they were talking about folk songs, and I was amazed to discover that many of their songs had the same words or the same meaning. In contrast, the language sounds nothing like Mandarin. So here's a white man who's a Muslim who has more in common with this random man in Xinjiang than the average Chinese person does. This difference in race, culture, and geopolitical circumstance is a major thorn in the side of China for a number of reasons. Let's list them out. Number one, as I mentioned before, China is worried about a pan-national or pan-religious movement from usurping authority in the region. Although the return of the Seljuk Turks or the Empire of Tatarstan is Not really possible. The regular exchange of foreign ideas based on cultural similarities is considered destabilizing. As you can see here, the death of this famous Uyghur folk singer was mourned all the way in Turkey, causing Turkey to quote lodge an official protest over China's Uyghur detention camps in the Xinjiang region. Two, China is worried about a pan-Islamist movement encroaching into its territory, according to this article. Quote, In July 2014, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the now deceased leader of the Islamic State, named China first in a list of 20 countries and regions where Muslim rights are forcibly seized. Al-Baghdadi specifically cited the extreme torture and degradation of Muslims in East Turkestan. The culmination of Islamic State advocacy for Uyghurs came in a February 2017 video featuring Uyghur foreign actors training in Iraq and pledging to shed Chinese blood like rivers to avenge the oppressed. And lastly, number three, there's a word that the lady in the video I showed you used, and that's the word "tuanjie." Tuanjie means unity. But I can't overstate enough how integral this word is in Chinese society. Everything from family to your workplace, to the government, to the army, the high watermark for the quality of these social arrangements is tuanjie. Unity, unity, unity. Unity. Unity is everything. When someone from the West learns about what's going on in Xinjiang, they're of course shocked because they're used to ethnic diversity. It's a historic aspect of our own culture. But multiracialism in China is anti-Tuanjie, and it's not to the benefit of the group collective. The CCP puts a big show about how much they love their 56 officially recognized ethnic groups, but in truth, they actively want to erase them from existence. If you don't believe me, by their deeds you shall know them. Whether that's sterilizing millions of Tibetans, forcing schools in Inner Mongolia not to teach their own mother tongue, or putting hundreds of thousands of Uyghurs in forced re-education camps. Anything that isn't promoting Tuanjie is promoting disunity, ergo chaos. Uyghurs, chaos. Mongols, chaos. Cantonese speakers, chaos. And if one ethnic group stands up, then it's only going to empower the other dissatisfied groups to revolt as well. At least according to their logic. Then you're going to have foreign influences fanning the flames to pick up the scraps. This is the summation of what happened in the 19th century for China, and that time serves as a blueprint for what never should be allowed to occur again in China. 
Personally, a number of Chinese I spoke to in China don't like Muslims in the West. I'd like to think it's simply a result of government propaganda, but a lot of people don't really seem to have a problem with the genocide that's going on there, if they even believe it's going on in the first place. I can say the same thing for the Hong Kong protest. Chinese citizens were furious for Hong Kongers disrupting the Tuanjia. This all makes sense if you go back to what I was saying before. What's considered moral is order. What's moral is Tuanjia. It is in fact disrupting Tuanjia that would be considered immoral. Ultimately, people are going to decide what's right and wrong based on their own self-interest, and the self-interest of Chinese individuals is the survival of the group collective. And according to them, the only way for the collective to survive this 5,000 year long saga is to be victorious over the forces of chaos by any means necessary. Now if you go to China, there's very few VPNs that actually work. I'm seeing YouTubers shill these things like Surfshark and NordVPN, but none of these VPNs have been stress tested by the toughest internet control grid, which is China's firewall. I've tested over a dozen VPNs in China, and there's only one that works, and there's only one that everyone uses, and that's ExpressVPN. It costs as little as $12 a month, and what I love so much about this is that I can sign up with a burner email account and pay with Bitcoin, so I have no fingerprints anywhere. Anywhere. The funny thing is when I left China after the pandemic, seeing what was going on with the internet censorship in the rest of the world made me never unsubscribe from ExpressVPN. Check it out in the description below, retain your privacy, and lend your support to this channel. Thanks a lot for watching guys, make sure to subscribe and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.